This episode is brought to you by WeatherGuard Lightning Tech. At WeatherGuard, we make wind turbine lightning protection easy. If you're a wind farm operator, stop settling for damaged turbine blades and constant downtime. Get your uptime back with our strike tape lightning protection system. Learn more in today's show notes or visit weatherguardwind.com slash strike tape. Welcome back. I'm Alan Hall. I'm Dan Blewett, and this is the Uptime Podcast, where we talk about wind energy, engineering, lightning protection, and ways to keep your wind turbines running. Welcome back to the Uptime Podcast. I'm your co-host, Dan Blewett. On today's show, we've got a great guest, Jeff Grabner, who is the Managing Director of Wind at Technostrobe, is here with us. And Alan, my co-host, is also here. Alan, what were some of your takeaways from our talk with Jeff? Well, Technostrobe has some really interesting technology related to aircraft obstruction lights. So those red beacon lights you see on on towers and on wind turbines, uh, those are not simple devices anymore. They're not just a light. There's a lot more to them. Where there's LEDs in them, and they're there you have GPS sensors. There's all kinds of great technology in them. So uh, it's not a light anymore. And te- Technostrobe has some of the coolest technology out in the market right now. So this is a very interesting conversation. Yeah. And I, so I actually want to defend, I want to defend that point of yours because this is one of the things I find really interesting because I, when we get kicked off in the conversation, I share a personal story because I lived near a very big wind farm for many, many years. Um, but this is like one of those sort of like behind the scenes things where you just don't think of like, what's the deal with those red lights that they're actually really high tech. There's actually a really big story behind them and a lot of really smart people thinking about them and how they interact with the neighboring community. So in case you're listening today, and you're like, why would I want to listen to a podcast about blinking red lights and wind turbines? It's actually a really, well, hey, it was a really good dialogue with Jeff, who's been, he's like a wind en- energy um, lifer and he has tons of experience in the industry and just, it's a really good conversation about the whole scope of pro versus, you know, con of wind, of wind energy. But this is just like one of those little like oh i never thought much about that light and now i know lots about it and how actually how tight how high tech and interesting it is it's it's really that's kind of what i took away from this today was that beyond just the how do we make wind energy more friendly to the neighboring communities but just like that every little thing on all these devices like has a story right it has a story and it has a computer processor behind it yeah well, and so Alan, for you, having worked uh, obviously in aerospace for forever, um, you know, these obstruction lights are, they've been around for a long, long time keeping, but it's not commercial aircraft, right? Like a Delta flight is not worried about this. This is w- what kind of planes need uh, obstruction lights? Smaller aircraft typically that are flying what we call VFR, visual flight rules, which are flying at lower altitudes and uh, maybe taking a scenic flight at nighttime or at dusk. It gets really hard to see towers and obstructions unless they have the lights on them. So it does make a big difference when you're flying lower to know where you're, where you're at and, and to make sure you don't run into anything. There's a lot of aircraft charts, the FAA publishes charts about obstructions and that sort of thing, but you know it's just another piece of information to know, like over there are wind turbines. I don't really want to get too close to them. It's a very helpful piece of technology, even though it's simple in its application, it is very important to prevent a, a number of air accidents from happening. Yeah. And so one of the recurring themes of this, of this podcast is, again, like the town hall, like the, the concerns that the neighboring citizens like, hey, we don't want this wind farm in our area because of X, Y, and Z. And then just also how you know, these developers and, and vendors come together to say, hey, we can solve that problem for you. You know, birds aren't going to be, you know, dying. You know, we can solve the light the light issue so that you're not going to be losing sleep. You're not going to have these major issues with it. You know, it, it's just an overall interesting dialogue, I think, how all these different companies come together to solve some of these problems that otherwise hold up a wind farm project um, and just how crucial those jobs are. Because again, if, if everyone's anti-wind farm because they don't want these red lights or they don't want this or they're afraid it's going to damage you know their crops or the neighboring you know fowl or it's going to impact their their cattle or something then that that's a major problem to the renewable energy industry and so you don't think about some of these little things and just how like i said 
how important the engineering of it is, the thoughtfulness of it, and also the messaging, letting people know like, hey, yeah, these red lights could be a problem. They have been a problem in the past, but now we're fixing that solution. So it's not going to be a big deal for you guys and it should be okay. We can bring all the benefits of a wind farm without a lot of the things that used to be major detractors. That's right. New technology. It's We're pushing wind turbines forward pretty fast right now. And this new technology makes a big difference to the, the livelihood of people that are near them. All right. So, Jeff, uh, first off, thanks for coming on the show. Really appreciate you. Absolutely. Thank you guys for hosting. So you are out in Cleveland, and I'm sure obviously you have a, probably a lot of customers out in the Midwest. I was actually a Midwest resident in Illinois for nine years, and we, we had talked about this off camera that there's a huge uh, wind farm out in central Illinois where at night, and I still remember like the first time I drove through this, just the entire farm, it's probably hundreds of wind, wind turbines, maybe not that many, but it's really, really big, and they all have this uniform blink, this big red blinking. Um, you know, obviously to, because there's lots of crop dusting planes and all sorts of aircraft in the area. So your company, Technostrobe, you guys supply, um, lots of different products to wind turbines, but also, um, you know, these, these lights that help keep planes safe, that help keep the, the wind farm safe. Um, but what I want to start about here, what I want to start with first is, you know, we've heard a lot of these these things that are necessary with the FAA, right? We have to keep all these tall objects safe from planes so they know they're out there. Um, but these can also be a big concern with local citizens. So if you live near that big wind farm in Illinois, for example, you might not love the fact that there's these ginormous machines out there blinking red, you know, lights off and on all night, you know, 365, 24 seven. So um, can you talk to, let's start with just in general, the aviation obstruction lights, um, are they typically a cause of contention and, and what does your company do? What is your solution to help mitigate some of that, that light pollution? It's a great question. I think you're starting from the 30,000 foot view. And what's key about that, Dan, is your, your story of driving through Illinois is for probably anybody that drives by a wind farm the first time is you have just sheer awe. I mean, these machines are massive. They're well over 300 now to 600 feet tall. And you don't think about the red lights for two reasons. One is if it's daytime, they're not on until dusk. The second one is when you drive by them in those first couple times, you don't pay attention to, to the cherry on top as you will. You just keep driving by and mind your own business. But I think for those that live within proximity to see them daily or multiple times a day, then you start to notice the nuances of a wind farm or even a wind turbine generator specifically. So that's why I think where the, the, the topic starts to begin is it's affecting communities. It's affecting the residents that are within sight distance or proximity to a wind farm. So you are correct. Um, when a developer is going out to construct a new farm, and then obviously there's definitely multiple phases throughout that, that process, one of the first things they do is meet with landowners and local communities to say, here's what's going to happen. Here's what we would like to do. And from, you know, permitting, and processing to construction and commissioning, they walk you through the entire process. And currently today, spe specifically if you look at different outlets, media outlets, those that cover uh, renewable energy, whether you're pro or con against it, is that one of the top three points of contention now is the red blinking lights, which are technically called aviation obstruction lighting products. Um, again, these are, as you mentioned and alluded to, these are mandated by the FAA. So it's a truly is a love or hate it. Uh, you may not want to put them up, but you're required to by law. And so it's how do you find that happy medium between the two uh, that you must meet the rules of the government and the zoning for that. But two, how do you minimize the impact on residents and communities? So you're correct. Technostrobe, we are a Montreal based manufacturer, manufacturer of aviation obstruction products. Uh, not only do we produce them, but we quite heavily invest a lot of financial resources into the research and design of new products. Uh, we are innovative. You know, our company was founded in 2001. And at that time, our founder was working his way th through engineering school in Montreal. And part of his side job to pay for tuition was to climb communication towers and do the necessary maintenance. 
And so, as you can imagine, in the middle of January, you're climbing 600 feet up in Montreal. It's quite cold. Uh, the, <laughs> the weather's not too favorable at that point. And that was his eureka moment. That's when he said, you know, there's got to be a better way to do this. And that was when Technostrobe, as a company on paper, was birthed. And that's when he started to bring his idea to fruition, which is saying, we are going to be different. We're going to separate the optical solutions from the electrical solutions. And reason being, one, from his, ex his uh, experience, is if you have to do maintenance, it's much better to do it in a controlled environment, something protected, which would be inside the nacelle on turbine. The second part is, more than 90% of the time, if something's going to go wrong with an obstruction beacon, it's the electrical components. It's not the optical. So again, focus on those things you can control where it's you know, ease of use, ease of access, and then you're also not interrupting uh, possible power generation or having downtime on the farm. And can you, um, can you differentiate those two for our listeners? Because um, even me having done a pretty deep dig on the website, what's the difference between the optical components and the electrical? So take me through that a little bit. So there has definitely been a, uh, an evolution in the products. And I know you and I discussed that off air prior as well as there's been an evolution of the beacons themselves. And this isn't just for wind turbines. This is for obstructions. And technically, if, I, if my memory serves me correct for the FAA, AC 70 circular, which mandates which structure gets lights. Uh, once you get over that 150 foot marker, you must have an, uh, a red beacon during the day or during the night. If it's not painted, so it looks like just raw metal, raw steel, then you have to have a white light during the day as well. Um, so a long time ago that the technology was incandescent bulbs. Uh, probably remember those, you know, your first track lighting in your home. Can't touch it with your fingers or it burns out prematurely. Then it graduated to Xenon, and now we're in the age of LEDs. So there's reliability to that. So our beacon, when I say optical, is just the LED components, the flashing mechanism, as you will, where you're seeing light emitting. Uh, our electrical, which is typically placed inside the nacelle, is the brains behind the operation. Uh, it's your power and alarms, it's your GPS, it's your uh, command central for photo cells, and also two-way communication. So it's keeping those you know, motherboards, as you will, so true circuit boards protected and housed in a locked environment. That's what we mean by separating electric or optical from electrical. So you've been in the wind industry, not just uh, with Technostro, but you've been in the industry for a while. And you said you built a lot of relationships. Um, you know, I find this whole pro and con, you know, this whole for or against wind energy. It, it's it's such an interesting debate because sure it, this could be this could be a republican or democrat thing right it could be like where you fall politically but it can also like you said be what's in your backyard and how are you personally affected by it um so aside from just the red flashing lights i mean i just want to hear kind of like just just generally i mean how do you, how, how have you seen the evolution of people who are against wind energy how have you seen that evolve over the years i mean i know there's there's people are upset with about birds and the environmental impact there's the red flashing lights uh, but i'm sure you've you've seen and heard a lot about it over the years how have you seen that evolve are people more accepting of it now is it easier to get past some of these issues where do you where do you where what have you seen oh, i definitely think we could we could sidebar this conversation for well over an hour <laughs> Um, Let's do it. Because, you know, it could be generational, it can be political affiliation, mm -hmm. it can be a geographical location, it can be uh, your financial status. There's a, a wide gambit of criteria, I think, that helps people decide whether you like it or you don't. Um, but as, uh, you know, sales and marketing and business development has been much of my career. And there's one thing I've learned is when you're number one, the only thing you get is a target on your back. And that's where wind sits right now. Wind in 2019 and 2020 was the number one source of all new uh, power production or energy plants constructed in the United States. So it is not a force of vengeance, but it is a force of progression. And so when you think about wind since 2008 to probably 2014, the average price of a turbine has come down 40 to 55%. So it's becoming a level playing field. And from a, a political standpoint, it's not truly subsidized. There are production tax credits, which are incentives for groundbreaking and commissioning a new farm, but it is definitely not on a complete level playing field as it would be to traditional fossil fuels and other types of carbon-based carbon, uh, carbon -based energy. So I think that's the, the point from the political standpoint, but in terms of why people support it or why people don't like it, you know, it is 
it is it can be an eyesore i'm fully there I, i've driven by wind farms i think me personally i think they're engineering modern marvels uh, it's an isosceles triangle it's a certain number of pigment paint for this specific white so i think it can be aesthetically pleasing and the, the power output is incredible and so when you look at it energy efficiency and energy independence which is where our country is going towards you need a diversified energy portfolio so you know I, I love the smell of the old leaded gas and high octane running but i also am on the on the the side of we need new energy we need renewables we need battery storage uh, the new hot topic of green hydrogen so i don't know if you can really pinpoint in terms of why people are pro or or, or why people are against it but I think that there are always things to put on the table in terms of what makes something good and what makes something bad. And you're right, you know, from bats and birds and all these other different third party things that come up to say either it's good or it's bad will always be there. But how can you answer it? And that's kind of when I try and rest my loins as I do in my career is in God we trust all of those bring data. And so when you when you talk <laughs> about birds, skyscrapers alone still kill more birds every year as well as cats than wind turbines do. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't say it's Darwinism, you know, survival of the fittest. I, you know, the bird should have turned and diverted the, the obstruction, but uh, things do happen. Well, do you feel like it's gotten easier over the years? So, I mean, is there, I guess one of my, here's maybe the core question is, are any wind farms not being developed because of pushback from neighboring communities? Have you seen many in the past where maybe that's starting to trickle out? Oh man, I shame on myself for quoting statistics before and not having those ready now. <laughs> I definitely think there are a handful of farms that have not received final permitting based on pushback from local communities. Mm -hmm. um, typically developers are very thoughtful and thorough when they go to propose a new farm that all party involves should be content with the outcome. Um, but I, I don't know of any off top of my head that recently would have been shot down specifically by that. I know there, oh, actually there was one in North Dakota, which was going to be the Russo wind farm. And in North Dakota, which is not to get ahead of the card here, but where they have mandated light mitigation into law, which is minimizing the impact of the red blinking lights, is Russo wanted to wait for a new type of technology, um, this dimming light dimming technology, which is not approved by the FAA. And so because of they wanted to wait for it, the farm got shot down. Hmm. Okay. So it's well, sidebarred. I'm going to say it's completely extinguished, but it's definitely been pushed back a few years. Yeah. There was that big one, obviously, in, in the uh, the Great Lakes earlier this year that was, it looked like it was going to get shelved completely, really just because of political pressure. Um, it seemed like the coal industry or one of the industries, I mean, you're probably aware of that one, right? That's, That's uh, in Cleveland. Absolutely. My hometown. Yeah. The Icebreaker yeah. Wind Project. Um, yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's been going on since 2009, and it still has yet to come <laughs> to reality. <laughs> wow. So there's, I think there's, wow. you know, that's, yes, there's birds and bats for that one specifically. You know, when you're in a lake and this is proposing mm -hmm. to be the first freshwater wind farm in the United States, you're going to have a huge mountain to climb. Um, there was House Bill 6 in Ohio, which was the biggest racketeering scheme for any public utility in the country. Uh, so that's, I won't go into detail on that, but. Mm -hmm. It essentially blocked a lot of renewable energy in the state of Ohio. Uh, Ohio is probably the most difficult state to deploy and erect any type of renewable energy project in the state, in the country. So let's get back to uh, your tech. So obviously one of the issues is you need this light. So let's talk about some of the, the FAA mandates and the regulations. So the light has to be bright enough for a pilot to see it at a certain distance, right? I'm sure, Alan, you're very familiar with some of these standards as well, being yeah. an aerospace aerospace guy. Um, but it, from your website, it says that basically your goal with your lid system is to dim your lights as much as you can because you're going to detect the weather system and the, and, the, and the lighting conditions, essentially, the atmospheric conditions. Is that right? Is that kind of how it works? Yes. Um, so... The FAA does mandate in terms of what products are certified to go on top of turbines. And then there's the also the other, which is the AC70. And then there's the AC50, which is how are those products functioning? So to put a turbine or a beacon on top of a turbine today, it has to be L864 certified. So you can always go on the FAA's website, tell you who those manufacturers are and what products are certified to that. So you definitely have to go through a lot of 
a lot of testing and qualification to become a certified manufacturer for the FAA, which is by nature a very risk adverse organization, rightfully so. <laughs> But when it comes to minimizing the impact, um, you know, a, a beacon, as you mentioned, perfectly stated, when it becomes dusk, the red lights become turn on. And typically that's executed through a photocell, which measures light, available light. So once that light goes on, it blinks at a certain flash rate, which is usually anywhere from two to four seconds. It flashes until dawn the next day. And when that flash occurs, the FA standard is to have it, the intensity of that beacon at 2000 candela which is quite bright. And right. part of the FAA's effort to minimize the effect of the obstruction beacons first began with the evolution of the technology, as we mentioned, you know, incandescent to xenon to LED, which mm -hmm. eliminates ground scatter. Now it's more efficient technology, but you're tightening the beam. What used to be 20 degrees with incandescent is now plus or minus 1.5 with LED. So oh, that was the okay. first attempt. Mm. Then the second one was synchronization. Uh, a wind farm is identified and considered one obstruction. So not like a cell phone tower, which you see as a standalone. A uh, wind farm, whether it's two turbines or 250, must all flash in synchronization, again, to minimize that impact of ground scatter. So your farm that you drove by in Illinois many times was probably a little bit newer where it, it had implemented that new synchronization. Yeah, they're all ones, yep. So Jeff, what are the requirements the FAA puts on the lights? are obviously intensity what about color and how does the sinking feature have to work so yes there is the intensity which is 2000 candela so that is current today um, and that's for a permanent beacon there are temporary beacons as well but that's during the construction phase so the 2000 candela is required for a permanent beacon it must be red um, probably above my pay grade if there's a specific hue of red that that needs to be but think of your average red led and then in terms of its frequency, each manufacturer has their own type of ID marking, you know, that frequency of flash rate. But every, again, it's either between two to four seconds is when that flash rate must occur. So how do they sync, the, how do they sync them all up then? What's driving that feature? Well, I know for, from Technostrop's perspective, it is through GPS. Uh, when I first joined the company, I thought the GPS was to help identify where the turbine is and where that beacon is. <laughs> Completely opposite. The GPS functions based on talking with the atomic clock. So sure. regardless of where that, that, that beacon is, it's all functioning off of one clock. So theoretically, any light I have manufactured and deploy will all be flashing in unison across the country. <laughs> wow. Okay. That's but tricky. there's always an ability yeah. to adjust it. Uh, you know, some, some developers <laughs> might say that I promise the community it's going to flash every 3.2 seconds. You know, that can always be adjusted at the factory level. Huh. Okay. Okay. That's, that's, that's cool. And the LEDs are, are red or are they white LEDs with a red lens on them? So they are red LEDs. Oh, cool. Um, because okay. if, there are situations, not really on a wind tower, but you know, broadcast towers, communication towers, utility towers that are not painted white. And when you have a structure that's not painted white, you have to do a white light during the day, which is at a much higher oh. intensity. That's at 20,000 candela because you have okay. to flash during the day to identify it. Hmm. Okay. So it's like a, it's like a two piece light then, or is it just a one piece light? It's just a, it's a one piece, but much bigger. Okay. Much bigger. So, so on those, on these new LEDs, you're like, you can actually change the color in, in that LED. Is that what's happening? It's like one LED and they're just changing the color of that LED. Or is it two separate LEDs? One's white, one's red. It is separate LEDs um, okay. for two main reasons. One is the color is the color comes from the factory, so it can't be okay. changed in the field. The second is okay. you need to have redundancy. Uh, an obstruction beacon must have 360 degrees of coverage, and right. even within that, you need to have redundancy. Should an LED burn out, which probably won't happen in our lifetime, that the other seven or ten or fifteen LEDs inside that fixture must still continue to emit light. Okay, so it's like a bank of LEDs inside this housing. Correct. Essentially. So it's a redundant, in, inherently redundant system, the way it's set up. Yes. And then the electronics are somewhere in, in the winter, and they're somewhere down in the nacelle or down in the base of the tower. Where, where are the electronics that control all this? Inside the nacelle, typically. Um, okay. You know, just with any so, type of like communication devices, the more linear length of cable you add to communicate, you start to lose, I think, uh, speed as well as effectiveness. Okay. So what's what sits on the outside of the nacelle? 
the, the light, obviously. Is there a GPS antenna sitting on the outside or any other piece of equipment on the outside? Uh, the GP antennas, antenna can sometimes be built inside the beacon itself. Sometimes it's Ooh. external. Uh, okay. Typically, it won't go on top of the nacelle. Um, those are OE OEM, your original equipment manufacturer's requirements. Right. So our, our beacon will have a mounting bracket, which helps it stand above any other obstructions on top of that nacelle canopy. Um, there's, okay. You know, weather vanes, lightning rods, all kinds right. of other meteorological devices, as you will. But my beacon right. has to have a full 360 uninterrupted line of sight to incoming aircraft. Okay, so it's got to sit above the wind vane, anemometer, all the all the nacelle equipment that's on. It's mounted to the top of the nacelle. That light's actually going to be mounted higher than all the other equipment. Correct, and then it's about a one and okay. a half to three foot, depending on the application, one and a half to three feet tall mounting bracket stand. Wow. Okay. The blade so spinning the... in front of it doesn't count as an obstruction. Right. Right. Huh. Right. <laughs> Interesting. So mm -hmm. is is the is the key feature the fact that it's two thousand candela, or is it that that 2000 candela is going to reach out and touch a plane at a certain distance because it seems like the that it just needs to be you know any aircraft needs to be able to see this at x amount of kilometers or miles away right so isn't that how your how the dimming system works where you can reduce the brightness if the skies are really clear and it'll still reach the same distance or where where am i falling short here on my explanation Definitely not falling short. It's always the devil in the detail. Um, and again, I don't work for the FAA, so I can't speak on behalf of them. But the reason we have red and we have 2,000 candela is so that an aircraft can pick up an obstruction at a minimum of, I want to say it's 1.3 miles out or 1.9 miles out. So okay. you have to be able to identify that because if there is an obstruction, a pilot has to move horizontally right. to adjust for that. So you're giving them that safe acquisition distance. Um, for us, sometimes we think that 2000 candela intensity on a wind farm, and we'll continue to harness on your farm in Illinois, if there's 100 turbines and 70 of those have lights on them, that is quite an obstruction in the sky every night for every three <laughs> seconds that that flashes. Um, yeah. Again, the red lights are there for not so much commercial aircraft, but military and civilian. Uh, that mm -hmm. fly below that 14,000 foot ceiling, which is right. what you call a VFR, uh, by visible flight route. And so let's say you're, you're it's a midsummer, it's 85 degrees, just much like it is in Cleveland today. Uh, you're out barbecuing, it's nighttime, and you have these lights flashing. It's overkill. Uh, the pilot can see that distance much further away than the required distance from the obstruction. So our theory and thought process is to go ahead and dim that down. Dim it down from 2000 candela or to 600 candela or even down to 200 candela, all while still providing the pilot with a safe acquisition distance that's required by the FAA. Okay, so it sounds like it's more the acquisition distance that the FAA mandates than the candela? Correct, it's all about safety. Okay, so it, does, so it wouldn't have to be 2,000. It just needs to be able to pump that out so that it can meet that spec when it's really, really cloudy or when it's cloudy or foggy. Whatever. Correct. Yeah. Or if it's Los wow. Angeles and, and it's, you know, <laughs> a regular day. Blade, Blade, Blade Runner 20, you know, 49. And it's Los Angeles every day. Yeah, 80 right. meters. <laughs>
2018 when the state of North Dakota, PSC, their public safety committee, began to receive a lot of complaints about wind farms. Uh, North Dakota is a great state for it, but they didn't like the red lights. So they came up with a law, uh, it's House Bill 1378, that now mandates any wind farm in the state, whether old or new, must have a technology to, it, to minimize the impact of red lights. And Technostrobe at that time helped work with the North Dakota PSC to come up with a term called light mitigation solutions. So let's look at these lights and how we minimize the impact. Uh, and at that point, originally they were saying, well, you have to use radar, it's the only technology. Well, you kind of pigeonhole yourself into one, one type of product and one solution. So again, that's where light mitigation solutions became the topic. So as North Dakota has been updating their wind farms and working with owners and operators to be compliant for this House Bill 1378, it seems to be gaining traction around the country because uh, more and more as wind farms are constructed, specifically new ones, they're closer and closer to bigger communities mm -hmm. and even somewhat right. right on the back door of some of these guys. So now it's becoming question and a conundrum that the developers are facing. Hey, I want to do this beautiful wind farm. Here's all the tax benefits to local municipalities and schools and road construction will do and road improvements. Um, and but most importantly, the royalties that landowners are going to get from this for you know up to 20 or 30 years. The communities will say, well, I don't want the red lights. That's the only part I have a complaint about. So it really is a case by case situation. If the developer wants to uh, listen and act upon those concerns of the community. So as you mentioned, you can always go with a simple cost-effective red light, which is often very common. Uh, there's nothing wrong with it. You're meeting the requirements, and that's up to the owner and operator at that point if that's what they want to do. Yeah. But it is a growing topic, and it is growing momentum from communities and legislators to consider opportunities. So that's where Technostrobe's new technology is coming in as a possible alternative to what exists today. Yeah, because it seems like it falls into that, that whole dialogue is like, well, all of us, you know, GE or Vessus or Siemens Gamesa or all these different wind farm operating companies, they're all maybe competing against each other, right? But they're all in the same industry together, which is, hey, if everyone likes what we sell, it's a lot easier to sell it. It's a lot easier to put it up. There's going to be less pushback. So if we all sort of commit to some of these kind solutions you know and this kind of goes back to almost like labor stuff right if everyone if we can all just agree that yeah fifteen dollars as a minimum um you know minimum wage might hurt a little bit but we all recognize that it's good for workers which is in turn probably good for us and that seems like almost like a sort of similar analogy but some of these like kind business things that might not be as financially viable or as financially i don't know what's the word i'm searching for here alan but not, not as cost effective maybe but they're better for the long-term industry. Because if, hey, we sort of always choose this kind solution that makes neighboring communities more at ease, now fewer people around the country have these stories where, yeah, I, I hate the wind farm down the street. If fewer people have that story, then maybe it gets easier for everyone in the industry, whether they're competing against each other or not. Alan, do you see it that way? Does yeah, this kind well, of fall in that same bucket? Yeah, it does in, in a sense because if you're in, installing a new set of wind turbines somewhere you're talking about 20 years of red lights right right a, it's a lot of it's a lot of red that's, lights that's a long time right and so as if you're a neighbor to that you'd want to minimize that impact as much as you could but still meet the FAA requirements because you don't want an airplane running into these things so you're trying to find that that balance and the delta cost of the system compared to the cost of the farm is just so incrementally small that it shouldn't even matter because I do think the PR is worse than the little bit of added cost it, it doesn't even make any sense, right? You definitely want the, the PR to be in your on your side because otherwise you're going to end up in the North Dakota legislature arguing about a bill. And so you got North Dakota sort of pitted against the FAA and you got this federal state thing battle that's going on. And you don't want to be in the middle of that. You want to put some wind turbines up and start making some money. So uh, you have to give somewhere, right? Why not give on the thing that makes the most sense and makes the neighbors happy. <laughs> that, or that, even, seems, you know, that seems easy. Maybe not so much a give, but you're planning ahead. Yeah. And I think that, that's, that's right. the way to look at it is, you know, light mitigation, yes, it's it's by law, it's written in North Dakota, but it's kind of, that's the nucleus. And now it's starting to spread out. Right. And so if I were a developer or somebody that's going to go personally finance a wind farm, I'd want to think ahead of the curve. 
So right. buy the technology that's adaptable. Um, you know, one of our products works for radar or for lids. So at least you're making the investment now of say, arbitrarily 20 or 30 or 40% more than your normal simple red light. But once right. that comes to having light mitigation a requirement, you don't have to retrofit. You can simply That's add it. one piece of equipment or do a software update and you're ready to go. And a lot of these guys in yeah. North Dakota are now having to strip out old lights, buy new lights, uh. and then buy the new equipment to become compliant. So the mm -hmm. costs start to compound themselves. Right. Right. It's easier to do it right the first time. So what's what's the radar approach? What technology is that exactly? What does that do? Sure. So you typically have a radar system and imagine like driving by an airport and you see that red thing spinning around and around. Yeah. Something similar uh, goes on the wind farm, typically more the, the nucleus, the center of the farm. And it is spinning, waiting for aircraft that are on that VFR, the visual, visual flight right. route. Right. Picks up a, a plane that's typically about five nautical miles out and then says yeah. a, single, a signal to the farm says, hey, there's a plane coming in, turn on all the lights. And then the lights stay on until an X amount of time or distance huh. when that aircraft is then past the obstruction. That's really okay. radar in, in a nutshell. Uh, it's a very reliable cool. technology. It's very deployable. Um, sure. People like to use it. Is, is that different than... That doesn't circumvent the FAA requirements to have the red lights. Is that just an addition or that just when you could dim because, hey, we see a plane coming or wh when would you use that or what, where is where is that deployed versus just the regular? So when you think about how to control these red lights uh, under this light mitigation type theory, ADLS or aircraft detection lighting system radar is the only one that's approved by the FAA today. Uh, Rightfully mm -hmm. so. Radar's been around for a long time. We know it works. Yeah. Uh, think about your yeah. old James Bond movies, you know, boom, you know, a little more sonar, yeah. but similar concept. Yeah. But people don't complain about the airplanes. People are complaining about the lights. And that's where yeah. Technostrobe, again, there's got to be a better way. That was our thought process. Let's address the lights. So it's not the planes. Let's figure out how to make the lights more welcoming, more receptive to communities. So we completely remove aircraft out of the, the picture. And Alan, you can probably attest to this. For any military or civilian pilot, the worst thing you can do for an obstruction is turn off that light. Because right. if it never comes back on, you don't know what's there. And not gonna worry, that's you don't want that situation to be brought forward. So by dimming the light, we're always keeping the light on. And so you're you're providing a safe acquisition distance and a safe marker for aircraft to identify that and to make the necessary adjustments. But the communities don't want to have to always see them. Um, so by dimming them down, it becomes more, you res respond to it better. Think about dimming a light in your home. You know, when you're going to bed at 10 o'clock at night, you don't need your lights on all the way. I'd much rather have them dimmed down. <laughs> dim down. Um, because when you have a radar system, those lights are coming, going from off to on. So from pitch black sky to 2000 candela, and they call that the shock and off phenomenon. That is, wow, well, there are those lights. Um, so is there a way to remedy that or, again, meet in the middle? And that's where we see the LIDS technology coming into play that we will adjust the intensity based on the weather. So we use a, a visibility meter that allows us to understand particle density in the air where we can measure sleet, snow, rain, dust, etc. And we have these strategically placed on top of certain turbines within a farm. And what I'm doing is measuring that visibility in the air. And then through a lot of our IP, we then figure out how to increase or decrease the intensity of the light. Okay, that's that's super cool. Okay, so, so the way the system works from a top level is it senses that there's an airplane somewhere near. For radar. But it also senses yes. with the radar. The, the radar says, hey, there's, there's an object flying around us somewhere. The next thing it does is it says, what's the weather conditions? And if the weather conditions are a clear sky, then the intensity of the light is much lower than if it's a snowstorm, which goes probably to Fulbright or Fulbright. Fulbright. You're Fulbright. inside not looking at the lights anyways at that point. <laughs> right. But Exactly. Right. But I will go back on your comment there, Alan, is typically you won't see a wind farm with both. Either you see a wind farm doing radar or in the future you'll see a wind farm doing LIDS technology. Okay. They can do both if they want. I, I haven't seen it done yet, but that's also going to be extremely expensive is my opinion. 
Well, that's I think that's coming though, because I think the technology is going to get less, just like with LED lights, um, LED lights 20 years ago were super expensive and now they're everywhere, right? And the technology for radar and the expensive radar is going down dramatically and the computing software is just exploding. So it seems like eventually you're going to get there, that that's not out, that's a conceivable pathway to go, because I do think being more proactive with the neighbors, that makes a lot of sense. I think you could... That makes a, a total sense if you have radar system one is that it only turns on when there's an airplane near so you're not going to see it most probably most nights in north dakota there's not a lot of aircraft traffic besides maybe military and then and then you know and and if you have this dimming system then it doesn't it's not so noticeable people people won't care as much but it also because you're also controlling the the, the width of the beam of light it isn't like you're blasting the light everywhere either with leds you can really control that that's, that's a huge shift in technology from 15 years ago. It's just dramatic shift. So you're, you're addressing really the consumer, the power users' concerns about wind turbines straight up. That, that's, that's gigantic. It's gigantic, gigantic leap. There is going to be an evolution, not only in the functionality, but the financial side of the cost. I mean, you know, think about the first DVD player you bought. It's probably $1,000. <laughs> yeah. And now, yeah. now you get them for free, <laughs> even if you right. have one they're, anymore. <laughs> they're gone. They're obsolete. Right. Yeah. 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 And I think your system is really intriguing because it's adaptable. Like you said, you can do a lot with software. With an LED, you can do a lot of different things with, with right. just changing the software. That's a, that's amazing because the old systems like you see out in California or in Texas are really arcane. You would have to rip them out to put something better in, where right. if you start off with technology, it's adaptable, then five years from now, you want to make it different, you could. Well, the, the technology that's that's also sensing what the atmosphere looks like is also useful in other things in terms of wind turbines, right? Icing conditions, you would like to know, are we, is this, are my turbines in an icing condition? I know generally in the area, if I'm in North Dakota, I'm probably in icing conditions six months out of the year, but, I have this other piece of data point, which is physically on the turbine. I can use that data for other things. If I own those turbines, I want to know that, right? And and I think all this technology that's going in there that just is really specific to the light is not specific to the light anymore. You're adding a lot of knowledge to what the environment those turbines are in. When do I want to maybe shut them down because the icing's too bad? You know, those kind of things are really interesting that... Uh, just because the wind turbines and the sense, mostly the sensors, the sensors are going, wind turbines are getting much smarter. So it just opens up doors of opportunity. So Jeff, I want to hear a little bit about uh, offshore. So I'm sure the qualifications or the regulations are very different for offshore because, you know, no people living off, uh, you know, way off the coast, but Maybe sea turtles are bothered by these red lights. I don't know, but can you can you speak a little bit to some of the equipment that's needed on offshore turbines instead of onshore? Sure. Well, I think that's where you know the EPA starts to get involved, and rightfully so. They want to make sure that this is a right choice from a engineering perspective, a construction yeah. perspective, and then a marine habitat one. Um, mm -hmm. Tying all things together, there's the Burning River incident in Cleveland that actually caused the EPA to be uh, commence and form a new organization within the government. So it's your fun trivia for the day. And just there a we go. Okay. tanker that came <laughs> in, and stirred up two dirt, dirt, dirt at the bottom and uh, all the methane <laughs> gas came up and caught on fire. So hence the burning river, which is Cleveland's Cuyahoga wow. River. Wow, that's crazy. It's good beer about that too, but anyways. Well, in the Simpsons, Homer Simpson <laughs> got his entire town put inside a bubble. Did you know this? I remember that one. Yeah, he got he calls his whole town to get stuck. All right, anyway, I digress. Keep going. <laughs> and Maggie was the only one that got out. Maggie, <laughs> yep. Yep. Little Maggie. <laughs> um, so when it comes to offshore, um, you know, I can speak from experience of attending a lot of the meetings and town hall meetings and construction meetings for the Icebreaker Project, which was going to be here in Cleveland. And when mm -hmm. you first think about it, yes, you think of these foundations, whether they're monopile, they're jackets, they're floating, they're getting sucked to the seabed, can be harmful or disruptive to sea life. But they're actually coming out with studies that it actually increases and flourishes marine life because you're creating a new habitat for home, a new habitat for uh, seasonal mating, etc. So there's a lot of benefits to it. The challenge I know with one of the big projects on the East Coast, which just got 
final clearance I think this week was Vineyard Wynn, which first originally leased land in 2015. Six right. years you've been paying lease payments and you can't do anything yet. Um, but I know Yikes. at the time they were still trying to do studies on what the oceanic currents were doing and any effects that it was having in Greenland. So from Martha's Vineyard to Greenland, they wanted to know what wow. the impact was on the environment. So it's this is a global energy, it's a global output. But when it comes to offshore, um, it's much more exciting. And I say that because the machines alone are huge. These are mammoth. Um, I think the biggest one now is like a 14 or 15 megawatt. And when it does one full rotation, it can power your home for two days. <laughs> two days with one rotation of the blades. So the, the yeah, output is crazy. incredible. And so the scalability, the blades are bigger, the towers are bigger, the cell on top has, you know, helicopter landing pads now. It's just, the, the, the size again is just, it's a shock and awe. But from a product standpoint for us, you know, on the aviation side, it's all still the same, at least in when it's going to be close to the continental United States, because that's the FAA is the governing body at that point. But again, when you're looking at an offshore wind farm in Europe or Asia, South Africa, different geographical regions will have their own input based on whatever that federal jurisdiction is in that region. So from an aviation standpoint, you still need red blinking lights. You still need these different systems to go with it. But as you and I kind of talked about at one point, Dan, is then you go into the marine, the maritime industry, and it's a whole nother ball of wax. You know, how do they deal with that with the ships? Are, are there lights down lower for the ships not to run into the turbines? So all these turbines are going to have marine lanterns for boats. There'll be a foghorn, which detects a signal from incoming ships and then blasts its wow. signal. There okay. are uh, recon antennas, which communicate to all the boats. And then even, you know, you can't access these with uh, your normal trucks and other vehicles to do maintenance. So then they also have helicopter lights on top to be able to identify those at night, uh, whether it's inclement weather or clear skies, to be able to identify the turbines to be able to deploy workers to go ahead and do o and work. Sure. So yes, there are a lot of maritime pieces of equipment. So you're saying there are sensors that will detect a sound from a boat and then it will sound like it'll create a, a horn to... Say, hey, I'm, I'm a turbine, I'm here. Well, it's similar to like an airplane for a radar farm. You know, it's constantly sending the yeah. signal out. And I can't remember the name of that piece of equipment, but uh, a radar and a wind farm will either catch the signal from the plane or catch the plane. And mm -hmm. in the maritime industry, there that radar you see on top of boats is sending signals out. And when a foghorn picks that up, it says, hey, there's a ship coming in, start blasting your horn, because that's the first line of defense. And then if they get too close, then they can start to see the different marine lanterns around all of the, the farm itself and continue to advert that obstruction. That's cool. Yeah, that's that's really interesting that it's, yeah, that all these just machines are talking to each other and saying, hey, just, you know, don't bump into me. <laughs> these are all, these are all Simpsons. <laughs> I gotta stop trying, I gotta stop letting the Simpsons jump back into my memory, but there's that episode <laughs> where Homer... I don't know. He like gets in some sort of mental state, and and Marge goes to look for him, and sure enough, he's like in the la the lighthouse or something because that's where he always goes because he likes the flashing lights. <laughs> I mean, they talk about this that there's always there's a Simpsons for literally every life scenario, and I all right, I got to stop. But you're right, and on that every wind farm, whether it's onshore, or offshore, is its own closed network uh, from a digital perspective and electrical perspective. So they communicate with each other but they are very tight on security. Um, so you can't enter that, whether it's physical or digital. Wind turbines, especially offshore, are getting so big so fast. Um, is there anything that you foresee, like, hey, we might need this in the future or some solution for a problem? that? Ha are there any problems that haven't been solved yet that are maybe cropping up because these, just how fast they're growing? Or is there any like really new kind of cool technology that's just come about because they hit a new threshold where now there's a new regulation that they're subject to or just there's some new thing it's like oh we got to solve for x or for y that we didn't think of before from my my chair and where i sit i don't know of any new technology but i think there will be a new problem uh there will be a new thing to solve and whether yeah. it's communication it's um, a lot of people are talking about the foundation itself how you can manufacture that at a lower cost a higher speed so i think it's a, a physical standpoint but you know, probably the biggest thing that we're gonna have to figure out is how you bridge that gap with communities. And it's not gonna be the obstruction light. It's that my my ocean my oceanic view, which has been pleasant, and the reason I built a home here in yeah. the East Coast is now gonna have turbines. Yes. But these are gonna be 20 or 30 miles off the coast. I mean, you'll be lucky to see them in my opinion. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, we talked about that before. And, and Alan, I know there was a study that you and I talked about on one of our summer, I think, episodes that it was having people rate how unple was it how unpleasant they were based on it was like 5, 10 or 15 or 20 miles offshore or something. Right. Yeah, they got That's to right. like sort of simulate this like VR maybe. But it, it seemed like it brought, got pretty fair marks. Like people weren't too upset about it. But I guess if you have a $20 million like Nantucket home, you might feel a little bit yeah. different. I don't know. That's what happened in, off of Martha's Vineyard, right? Is that the vineyard wind has gotten pushed back. Well, Ted Kennedy didn't want it for years because of the, their compound was there. But after that, you know, it, it's been a constant push of we don't want to see these things in our in our view view line or on off the shore. We don't want to be able to see them. So that's why they've gotten so far offshore. But one of those interesting pieces early on was I don't want to see this blinking blinking red light out my window all night. That was mm -hmm. one of the early pushbacks, right? So I, I do think, you know, as the technology gets smarter, a lot of these conditions will start going away. They will, if we're smart about the technology. Check the box on the red blinking light now. Yeah, now you just have to worry about right. the actual giant turbine out there in the water. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but you're right, Vineyard Wind is in, uh, was it New Bradford, uh, Massachusetts is where it's off of. And it's you got a big fishing community, you've got political figure, figures, dignitaries, a lot of wealth. Right. And you yeah. have people for it and you have people against it. But again, every situation, every technology, every product, every car, everything's always going to have both sides of the fence. And what's that middle ground? Right. Um, and I think for us, right. it's energy independence. Right. And we can fix the technical issues or the, the things that are impediments. We can apply technology to them and make them better. And obviously you guys have, and I, and that's, that's what makes the wind turbine industry grow is that we remove those impediments and that's what we need to continue to do. So it's really cool to hear about this technology today because, um, you wouldn't think there's so much technology in aircraft lighting essentially, but there is, there's a lot of technology in, in there and, and it's, it's, it's cool that it continues to progress because we need to keep doing that and all, aspects right. of wind turbines we got to keep pushing well jeff whose job is it to so i assume have you have you been in some of these town hall meetings where they're addressing concerns of of neighbors and people who might be affected by it have you been in any of those uh, i've been to the one in cleveland and then for ones all over the country i've either provided powerpoints or chimed in on conversations and phone calls or public hearing meetings to actually inform and educate on uh, obstruction of lighting and available technologies. Going in really as an equal opportunity annoyer, saying they're all great, <laughs> I'm just gonna share information with you, but you can decide what yeah. you wanna do. Yeah, gotcha. Because my, my question is, who, you know, who's responsible? So say there's a big, you know, group of, you know, county X says, hey, we don't want these because we've heard these red lights are, you know, they're gonna be terrible. We don't want this. But the developers like, no, we've got a pretty good solution. Like this is going to be okay. We've, you know, we've, we've done this or done that, or we're going to use this supplier. Or we're going to use a dimming system or a radar. So this is going to be fine. How do those two groups come together? Like, is there a messaging campaign? Is there advertising? Are there like these big open town halls? Like how does the word get out that? No, we know you have a concern. Here's how we're going to solve it. I'm just envisioning it's like my cousin Vinny. You got the lawyer coming in in his leather suit to the small town. <laughs> no, you got to stay. You have to stay on the Simpsons here. This is the monorail episode where he comes with monorail, gets the whole yes. town singing, right? If you get the whole town singing, then you get your monorail and then you can leave with your briefcase yeah. of money. That's how that works. Well, you'll, you'll have to send this to Matt Groening later so he can create one on wind turbines specifically. <laughs> But, you know, I, I have these, these town halls, I think it's that's out of my control um, in terms mm -hmm. of why they have them, their frequency, their locations, topics of discussion. Because I'm sure there's a ton of questions. You know, there's what are the environmental impacts? Uh, are the, the shadow and flickering of the blades, is it going to affect my cows? And, and there's all kinds of stuff under the sun, moon, and stars that people bring up. And each one has an answer. And each one has a type of technology mm -hmm. or physical solution or a financial solution to make it amends. And so I think from you know Technos Show's perspective, we just continue to offer our, our expertise and our knowledge to our customers or even just developers or communities as a whole to be a, a, that bipartisan educator on obstruction lighting and technologies that are out there. Because you will have to, you probably want to see a demonstration. You'll probably want to see how it works before you can go there. I mean, most people don't test drive or buy a car without test driving it. 
Right. Some do. Uh, I have, mm-hmm. but at the same time, you know, you want that reassurance. <laughs> you're really going to like it. Um, so, Jeff, as we wrap up, you've been obviously like you, you're extremely knowledgeable in the industry as a whole, and you've been in WIN for a long time. Um, you know, we've talked about jobs and, and just how, you know, especially like with the Biden administration, they're they're pledging and trying with some of their their upcoming plans to produce a lot of jobs in, in renewable energy. Um, so with more and more young people potentially joining this industry, what what infra, or, uh, what advice would you offer them? What skills would you say, hey, if you're going to start learning and developing your professional sort of resume and your professional skills, what have you found to be really beneficial um, in your career? I think it's a, for anybody that's looking for a new opportunity, whether you're a recent high school grad, college grad, or career transition, is renewable energy is not going anywhere. It's here to stay. And it's from those folks that I work with and those relationships I've developed over the past one and a half decades is that no two days are the same. You know, again, it's a moving target. This is such a, a fast paced industry, a global industry that you're constantly working on something new. It's is how do I make the red blinking lights less of a problem? Or how do I get the blades to spin faster and make more electricity? Or how do I get a farmer to shake my hand and agree to let me lease his land for the next 25 years? There's so many moving pieces and parts that it has an opportunity for everybody. And so I very much enjoyed it. And I've gone through different endeavors within the industry. Each one has created new relationships that stick with me today, both personally and professionally. But I think if you're, so again, somebody that wants to come into this and look as this, as possible area for employment, whether it's short term or long term, is you can be local or global. So you have that opportunity because this is a global industry. Uh, They all have headquarters around the world and a lot of them stem from Europe. They stem from Asia, India, et cetera. Second one, you can be a contributor to the energy demand and future for the world as well as the environment. So you have an impact. What you do every day is going to make an impact for the next generation. And most importantly though, it is a close knit community. Uh, There was a lot of consolidation in the mid to late 2000s, so 2009, 2008 to say 2015, a ton of consolidation. But a lot of the people that were in the industry are still in it today. So I think you can build tenure here. There's a very low turnover because once you're in, you get infatuated with the people, you get infatuated with the demographics, the energy, the synergies, and it's, it's tough to leave. So... I would recommend it to anybody. Um, and there are those normal jobs. You can be a lawyer, you can be an engineer, you can be a sales and marketing guru, but you could also write your script for a new a new role, something that's unforeseen. And maybe that's where it goes for offshore is there's a new job yet that we don't know about and be the first one to do it. Well, Jeff, this has been a great conversation and we really appreciate your expertise and, and coming on the show to, to talk about uh, light mitigation with us. Where can people follow up with you and with Technostrobe? Absolutely. Website is always up and running, technostrobe.com. Um, happy to share my, my LinkedIn profile or uh, folks can even grab me on email if they want as well and uh, continue to host a dialogue or answer questions. Yeah. So if you're listening on uh, in podcast land, whether that's iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever, or if you're on uh, YouTube watching us on video, we'll link below in the description so you can uh, connect with Jeff on LinkedIn uh, or with Technostrobe. Jeff, thanks again for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. And thank you guys very much. All right, that's going to do it for the Uptime Podcast. Thanks again for listening. And we want to again thank our guest, Jeff Grabner from Technostrobe. So if you're listening on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, thank you so much. We appreciate you. Be sure to subscribe to the show. Leave us a review. It always help the show grow. Is downtime causing you financial pain and putting a stop to your power production for months on end? It's no secret, lightning strike damage is a major cause of wind turbine downtime. This damage is preventable with our easy-to-install strike tape lightning protection system for wind turbine blades. Our incredible engineering, build quality, materials, and edge sealants withstand up to five times more abuse in the toughest weather and lightning conditions. And we've got the research to prove it. If you're tired of constant downtime, we can help. Reach out to us at weatherguardwind.com and schedule a free call. We'll get your uptime back in no time.